Where do we draw the line between a thing and a person? What does it mean to be human in the 21st century? Troubling questions, and as you'll discover, disturbing answers. The new and extraordinary science of biogenetics may redesign the makeup of mankind. But as scientists pursue these goals and the wealth that may come with them, are they balancing the progress of science with the morals of humanity? That's a question raised in the story of John Moore, a man claiming his place in this future world. In 1976, John Moore, who was suffering from a rare and deadly form of leukemia, had his spleen removed in a Los Angeles hospital. The operation may have saved his life. Cells from his spleen were cultured, and the doctor who examined them, David Goldie, discovered that they produced an enormous amount of a hormone, CSF, that could be used in cancer treatment. Dr. Goldie understood the therapeutic and financial possibilities of these golden cells. He decided to put his patient to work. For nearly seven years, Moore underwent tests of all kinds. Only when his doctor asked him to sign a release for the use of his cells, did Moore understand that the procedures he was undergoing had little to do with his welfare. Who's going to argue with their doctor about over signing a form when you're on the operating table and your life is in danger? And if you can't trust your doctor, who can you trust? This is true. But I ask things in the, in the nature of, of, is there going to be any commercial value in this down the road? Uh, uh, what, what kinds of things are you developing out of this? The answer usually was always no, or it's, it's something for the future, it's way down the road, as, you know, there's really nothing uh, of immediate uh, impact happening. Do you own your own blood or any of the body parts that are taken from you in the hospital during surgery or any other kind of medical procedure? Well, you may think you do, but I'll tell you what, you may not. Our first two guests are here to discuss what may be one of the most interesting milestone legal cases taking place in the 80s this morning. John Moore and his attorney from Los Angeles, Jonathan Zappi. I didn't know any of this stuff until after we got into the discovery mode and, and ascertained that the doctor had already taken out patents. The university had, had patents on, on UCLA, show, yeah. UCLA, that they had formed and entered into contracts with... Uh, with Genetics Institute, a large uh, bioengineering firm out on the East Coast, that they were developing relationships with Sandoz Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the international, international oh, pharmaceutical pharmaceutical Massive company. contracts and, mm -hmm. and contractual relationships. And you were becoming a worldwide business and you didn't know it. I didn't yeah. know. I had no idea at all. It was, it was such a total shock to me. The John Moore case uh, was a very dramatic instance where an individual's, uh, in this case, blood cells, were very valuable in and of themselves, which was a very rare thing. Maybe only five or six people in the history of medicine are in that position. He wasn't treated fairly, uh, and he felt that he had been misled as to why he was undergoing certain medical procedures. And especially if you think that your life is in danger, and then you find out later that instead of being treated, you were being mined, this made the John Moore case a very symbolic case of how do we treat people when we need their blood or tissue for research. And he raised the question, if the doctor knows that my blood cells are valuable, why don't I get some of the value? The people who do the research on the tissue for drug development may discover something that's very valuable in a tumor or in a, a, a blood cell. And they may develop a drug that attacks that tumor. And they may make millions of dollars from doing that. So the person at the research discovery end may make a lot of money, and the patient has no claim to any of that. So as long as we have a capitalist system of drug discovery and the government's not funding all of it, people aren't going to do it if they can't make money. But they also spend millions of dollars, in some cases billions of dollars, in creating the infrastructure to turn tissue and blood into medical breakthroughs. And that is why they are also the ones to profit from it. Researchers argued that the work and investment needed to modify his cells gave them the right to patent what had been his genetic heritage. On July 10, 1990, after a legal process lasting seven years, 
the justice system was about to have its say. The crux of the John Moore case is that a patient owns his own body, his own tissues, his own DNA. The California Supreme Court disagreed, saying what happened to Moore might be unethical, but it wasn't illegal. People have no property rights to their own bodies. Moore spent the next decade fighting for patients' rights before he died last year. Ironically, Leucomax, the product made from Moore's cells, wasn't the expected gold mine. A competing drug took the lion's share of the market. But this wasn't the end of the saga of his now patented cells. So the John Moore cell line, called MO, is maintained in a repository of frozen cells uh, in Washington. And this repository has many thousands of cells from all sorts of organisms, from humans, from mice, from rats. And these cells are used uh, for research. And so you can actually find these cells online and order them. And so uh, you can buy this for $330. When you receive them, you thaw them out and can uh, grow them in a, in a tissue culture. John Moore's medical saga began just over 30 years ago. The story of how, without his knowledge or agreement, his cells were turned into someone else's property is as shocking and disturbing today as it was when it first made the headlines. However, as you'll find out after the break, things haven't stood still. And if anything, the stakes are higher than ever. In fact, in that case, the legal position I took was to argue only that he should have a right to inform consent and to be able to have the doctor have a fiduciary duty to act in a way that did not harm the patient. I didn't argue the property aspect of it because I was worried that the criticism would be that uh, people are just in it for the money. And the court really didn't intend that to happen. They really thought they were protecting the patient in some way. They uh, felt that they didn't want to see the important human body trivialized in some way. They were worried about the haunting of the image of slavery in our country where bodies were sold for profit. And so they thought they were adding dignity to a person by not holding that a tissue could be property. What's happened now, though, is totally unjust. What is said is that the tissue, the genes, can't be property of the person from whom they came, but can be property of the researcher. So it's not that we don't have a commercial, a commercial system. We have one, but it's just the property is given to the wrong individual. A patent is a grant between the government and an inventor that allows the inventor to exclude others from making and using his invention for up to 20 years. In exchange for that grant, the public is given the full written description of what the invention is with an enabling disclosure that allows one of ordinary skill in the art to reproduce that invention. The one thing that is excluded from patentable subject matter is human beings. The Patent and Trademark Office does not issue patents on human beings. However, anything else made by the hand of man, whether it be a transgenic animal, whether it be a plant, or whether it be an extract from a human plant or an animal. And that includes DNA, it includes enzymes, it includes proteins. It includes cell lines, such as embryonic cells. It includes immortal cell lines that we use in the diagnostics of diseases. It must be something that was taken taken from nature in a purified form that has a specific, substantial, and credible utility. Is director of a group concerned with the social and environmental impact of new technologies. In a new field like we're dealing with here in terms of human genomics, um, it's natural to get in fast with the biggest possible patents. Companies normally and logically would say, uh, this is sort of the Wild West. We don't know what's happening here. Uh, it's our chance to try to make claims, sweeping claims uh, with, with patents The patent examiners won't pay attention to, won't realize the implications of the claim because it's too new a field for them, so they may get away with murder. 